you will eventually get to a place, hopefully, where you have a great command over yourself. In other words, let me give it to you this way. When I first started singing, Persian music has a good amount of sadness to it. First, because our culture is sad. Second, because our history has been sad. And when you have a sad culture, a sad history, a sad political government, a sad social environment, where there is always struggle, where foreigners, England, America, France, they just come, you know, they get drunk behind closed doors and they just chop up the Middle East, you know, on a piece of paper. And the Middle Easterns aren't even in the room. But, you know, there are two, three, four, five white guys sitting in a room saying, okay, America, you take this part. And, oh, you Brits, you take that part. And you know what? We're just going to take this other part. I say, okay. And that's, that's all it takes. And then all of a sudden, you know, two months later, your country is invaded by, invaded by all these people you've never seen, you've never met, you've never talked to. And they're saying, oh, by the way, you know, this part of your land that you thought to be yours, it's really not. It belongs to France. France? What do you mean it belongs to France? Yeah, that's how it is. Now, if you only have bows and arrows and they have tanks, what the hell are you going to do? Well, you're going to fight for a couple of days only to realize that your people are getting massacred. So your chief sits with the president of France or, you know, America and say, okay, listen, we give in, we submit, fine. Instead of you guys taking 98% of our resources, can you just take 95 instead of 98? Say, okay, you know what, because we're feeling generous today, we're going to take 97%. You say, okay, that's fine. And when you have that kind of a history, you can't but have a great amount of sadness and sorrow and resentment and, and anger in that culture. But the anger, because the culture has depth, the anger expresses itself in music, in poetry, in art. You don't go around shooting people. You don't have mass shootings. It doesn't work that way. We have riots where all people come together to change the political environment so that the social environment could be transformed. But we just don't go around killing innocent people like the way this place has been for the past 30 years now. So when I first began singing, uh, I didn't want other people whom I found to be strangers to be able to look at my face, to see my facial expressions, and to see what's taking place inside. I didn't know them. I didn't care to know them. You know, my facial expression is my private space. I don't want that to be visible, to be shown to public. So I demanded, and because I have a very, very nice voice, I demanded that the lights to be turned off. And because in our gatherings, no one could sing like me, no one could inject emotions into singing like me, they had no choice but to turn off the lights. But there came a point where we had gatherings so often that they got used to my singing. And so when they asked me to sing, and when I requested the lights to be turned off, they said no. We were now friends. They could now stand before me and say, no, we're not going to turn off the lights. God damn it, you sing. Now, we have this instrument called daf. It's a drum. And I said, okay, only on one condition. Give me this drum. I'll put the drum in front of my face. I'll hold it this way. So no one can see my face. I'll sing, but I'll sing behind the daf. And when you're singing behind this drum, what happens, your voice hits the skin and echoes back. So you even sound better to yourself. And there came a point, and the reason why I had the deaf in front of me, it's something that Nietzsche argued about some time ago. If you have seen the image of Nietzsche, the face of Nietzsche, what he has, what just stands out, is he has this great bushy mustache. It's like, it's a foot long this way and a foot long that way. And so it is such a distracting piece on his face that every time you want to look at him, look into his eyes, the mustache get in the way. So you don't get a chance to actually gaze into his eyes, you just look at his mustache. And then the conversation revolves around his mustache. So how long have you been growing your mustache? Why is it curved in this particular way? How often do you comb it? Do you wash it? What happens when you eat pasta? The, you know, do animals grow in it? Insects, you know, do you have a jungle in there, a forest, an ecos ecosystem? Now, one time there was this clever young woman who goes to Nietzsche and she says, you're not going to fool me. She says, what are you talking about? I know you why you have your mustache. 
I look into your eyes and I see a great amount of sadness. Why don't you just shave your mustache so people can see who you are really on the inside? And Nietzsche says something very, very interesting. It's something all of us have done for thousands of years. But Nietzsche, in a very eloquent, philosophical way, was able to put this human dilemma in words. He says, it is true that my eyes are the windows to my soul. But you must know that my soul is very precious to me. It's very dear to me. I value it a great deal. And I open my soul only to people I trust, only to people I value, only to people I love. And the truth is, I don't love very many people. I also know that human beings are born to be nosy. They like gossip. They look at my eyes and they say, oh, Nietzsche, you're sad today. What is your sadness? And the truth is they ask not because they care. They ask because it passes time. It's chatter for them. I put my soul on the cross for them, but they only sketch it. They don't really know what's going on inside me. They don't see the pain. They don't see the loneliness. Uh, they don't see the misery and the tragedy, the hopes, the despair inside me. All they really want to do is have me get naked, stand there so they can sketch who and what I am on a piece of canvas. And I don't want that. And since my soul is pregnant with all these sacred emotions, I guard my soul really, really, really well. And tragically enough for me, he argued that God, and I'm paraphrasing, these are not what Nietzsche said really, but he should have. He said, I had this unfortunate creator, i.e. God. Now, he may have believed that God is dead. I doubt that very much. But if there was a God who gave birth to Nietzsche, this God gave Nietzsche a pair of eyes that exposed him. You know, when you're walking down the street and a stranger passes you by and you happen to be in a very strange mood, you look at him or her and you say, good morning. And he looks at me and says, good morning, son. Have a good day. And he says it in such a way that it's like you've become possessed and you all of a sudden stop in your tracks and the guy is passing you by and you look behind and you say, why did he talk to me in that way? What is his problem? You're mystified. It's as if he has said something to you, to you and certain doors inside you have opened and you say, okay, I'm young enough and, and kind enough. Let me, let me stalk him. And you run after him and say, sir, sir, I think you dropped a $10 bill. No, he didn't. It's really yours. But it's a way for you to trap him. So you and him can sit and have a cup of coffee. And so for Nietzsche, he was given a pair of eyes that when you were to look into his eyes, all these things about you would open up. You would feel things. And those feelings would inspire thoughts. Thoughts would inspire reflection. And all of a sudden, you were put in this battle zone on, zone on the inside. You were to examine your life, reflect on your life, feel bad about yourself, or maybe feel good, who the hell knows. But Nietzsche knew that he had this power given to him by God because of his eyes. And very much like if you've seen the first Superman movie, with great powers come great responsibilities. Nietzsche has great powers. His powers exist in his eyes. He has the power to look people in the eye and make them feel bad about themselves. Kind of like Jesus Christ that we killed Jesus Christ not because he was a wise man, but because he made us feel bad about who and what we are and how we live our lives. Nietzsche had that power, do you see? The only thing I can do to distract them from looking into my eyes and seeing their own reflection is by having this great mustache. So instead of people looking at me and talking about my soul and ultimately their own soul, They'll talk to me about my mustache and how they can grow their own mustache like mine. And they'll ask me when I go out there to kiss someone, does my mustache get in the way? And all of a sudden, a great conversation about philosophy turns into a conversation about sex and this ridiculous things that people do while they have sex. You see. Now, I say all of this for one simple reason. Nietzsche had the power to mesmerize me to intoxicate people with his ideas. But he was also wise enough to know that since many, many people are not really that interested, why should he spend all of his energy 
talking to people who are basically curious. They're not yet at a stage in life where they're really ready to learn, ready to listen. 